Good afternoon, everybody. This is Ian Trevethan. I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator from the Sternberg Museum of Natural History. And I am coming to you today with our uh, home from dome to home series, in my case. Um, and I am here with a friend. This is, this is my friend Nomas. I've had her for about 15 years. Um, and she is, she's going to be part of our subject matter today. Uh, but before we get to that, I've actually got some exciting annou announcements from the museum. Uh, I was just notified that uh, we are, in fact, extending the run of our uh, traveling exhibit, uh, uh, Prairie Ocean, Long Time No See. And uh, it, the stay will be extended until September 8th. So for those of you who... Uh, we're watching Reese earlier this week when he went through that exhibit. Uh, you will still get a chance, hopefully, to see it as it will be here through the summer. So we're hoping all this stuff will be over with before then. Um, excuse me, but there's never any guarantees about anything. So, um, so that's exciting. Um, the the museum lives on and so does the Prairie Ocean exhibit. So that's exciting. So why do I have a bird on my shoulder today? Well, um, it turns out actually earlier this week, a friend of mine who has kids uh, from my hometown of Spokane, Washington, um, sent me a message uh, that um, their kids had some questions about dinosaurs. And one of those questions was, do dinosaurs really, or did dinosaurs really have feathers? So um, I went ahead and did sort of a, a live feed with them, but I thought, wow, what a cool thing to talk about on the Sternberg live feed. So Abby, if you're watching this, this is for you. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about dinosaurs with feathers and how are they related to birds and how do we know that? You can hear Fei Fei in the background. She is not happy uh, because I have the bird out of her cage on my shoulder. Uh, I locked Fei out of our my, my office room here because I was a little worried that she might get weird with the bird. So I didn't want that to happen. So she's locked out and she is protesting right now. Um, <laughs> But uh, anyways, in spite of doggy barking protesting, um, I wanted to talk about birds and dinosaurs. And uh, most paleontologists at this point agree that most, well, birds are dinosaurs. Um, but not all dinosaurs are birds, if that makes sense. So this is what we would refer to Oh, she doesn't like the camera. This is what we'd refer to as an avian theropod. So she is actually related to the group of dinosaurs that were actually meat eaters. Um, she is obviously not a meat eater. If you look at her beak, she's got a very specialized beak. She is a seed eater. But she's got some things in common with certain kinds of dinosaurs. Um... And unfortunately, because I'm at my house, I don't have a lot of dinosaur skeleton material. And even if I was at the museum, I wouldn't have a huge amount of dinosaur related material because we were under the ocean during the time of the dinosaurs, during the late Cretaceous. And so we didn't have a lot of dinosaur material preserved in our area, um, but I would certainly have a lot more to work with than I do in my office at my house. But I did bring an example of a dinosaur that we think is probably related and probably to birds and probably had feathers. So I'm going to show this to you. This is um, my fingers in the way. There we go. This is the skull of a raptor uh, this is a raptor from North America. You can find it all up and down the western United States from probably Utah, Wyoming, Montana, all the way up to Alberta and Canada. 
So this is a dinosaur called Deinonychus or Deinonychus, depending on uh, how you like to pronounce it. So uh, all of my paleontology friends out there, if you're watching, let's get a consensus. What is the proper pronunciation? Deinonychus or Deinonychus? Uh, I have never known. Uh, and it really depends on, um, I guess, who you're talking to and who you've heard pronounce it. I've heard it pronounced both ways. So uh, I am not an expert on the official pronunciation. I do that. I know that uh, the name itself, Dino, means terrible. Nikus means claw or foot. So terrible claw. <laughs> and uh, if you know your raptors at all, you know that one of the big associations with raptors are the big killing claws on their toes. So this is a... Uh, this is an animal that probably was feathered. And the reason we know that is because in different parts of the world, we found actually feather impressions. And more recently, we've actually found, uh, I think the most recent find was a bit of tail encased in amber. Um, but more, uh, I think more information is needed on that specimen. And there's some controversy surrounding that amber specimen. Uh, because of the way it was obtained and um, th there's a lot of discussion about whether it's an ethical thing or not. However, that aside, we have pretty darn good evidence that this kind of dinosaur uh, had feathers and that there are some very close relationships between certain kinds of dinosaurs and birds. So the big question is, how do we get from something like this to something like this. Well, one of the things that we use to um, compare the two kinds of animals, she's like wondering what is going on here. What do you think, Nomos? So Nomos is a Quaker parrot, um, and she came to us in Montana um, when we were living in Bozeman. And she's been with us ever since. She's been rescued and adopted a number of times. So she is a sweet bird. She is a female. She's laid eggs a couple of times. She does talk, but she's probably going to be really shy here. She says things like, come here and thank you. And she likes to whistle a lot. <laughs> so Nomas is a seed-eating bird. And as I was saying, one of the things that unites, oh, hi, one of the things that unites birds and dinosaurs together is what we have to compare to is their skeleton. Uh, and traditionally, skeletons are what paleontologists have had to work with. And as, as our eyes and techniques and methodology has gotten better over the years and over the decades, uh, so has our interpretation of what these fossils mean. So, uh, when we excavate um, dinosaur fossils, we're paying a lot more attention to what could be soft tissue pres preservation and skin impressions and feather impressions. So the, the more information we've collected, the more support we have for the idea or hypothesis that some dinosaurs are related to birds and birds are, in fact, a certain kind of dinosaur or certain kind of theropod dinosaur, which is closely related to the raptors and the meat eaters and uh, even T-Rexes. Now, I think if I were, you know, to have the ideal bird to use as a comparison here, um, you know, I would use a chicken maybe, uh, or if I was really crazy, I'd maybe an ostrich, but I don't, I have, I have this right now. Um, so one of the things that ties dinosaurs and modern birds together is their skeleton. Now, I don't have a good example of it, and I wish I had like an x-ray camera so I could show you an x-ray of, of my little bird here, but she's got a couple of interesting features. Number one, she's got what's called a furcula, which in, in uh, I guess, um, uh, normal unscientific language, we call that a wishbone. So you find a wishbone on your turkey at Thanksgiving and... You know, if, if you get the, the part that's bigger, you get your wish. 
Um, so that's called a furcula. And in fact, dinosaurs, even T-Rexes, had a furcula, uh, as do modern birds. So that's that's one of the one of the big things that unite these two animals. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is dinosaurs, certain kinds of dinosaurs, have actually spaces in their bones uh, for what we believe was for air sacs, uh, and so do birds. So the way birds breathe is really kind of fascinating, and I'll try my best to explain how that works. So you know how we breathe. We take in our breath, and then we let it out. And what happens when we take in that breath is our lungs... Um, utilize the oxygen and, you know, uh, through like many little air sacs in our lungs. And that um, has actually little blood vessels running through it, which sort of absorbs the oxygen and the blood moves the oxygen throughout our body to where we need it. Well, birds do something a little bit different. Yes, they do. Um, birds, when they breathe, they take in a first breath. Take a breath. Okay, thank you. And then they exhale, but the breath that they're exhaling is not the breath that they just drew in. So what they actually do is they take the next breath and that first breath that they had breathed in actually gets pushed into those air sacs in their bones and those big spaces in their bones. And what's that? what that's doing is allowing their body to utilize the oxygen a little bit better even than we do as mammals. So, um, so... By the time she's taking in a third breath, she's exhaling that first breath that she brought in. Hopefully that makes sense. It's a, it's a kind of a tough concept to talk about without some sort of um, visual reference. I was going to print out uh, some bird skeletons and sort of a visual reference of how birds breathe. But then I discovered that my <laughs> printer is out of ink. And I didn't have time to go explore for a place that's open that has printer ink, the kind of printer ink that I need. So my bad. I was poorly prepared for this. I apologize for not having good visual references. But I thought it was pretty cool that I had this. So, of course, um, birds and dinosaurs have these skeletal um, things in common. Um, there's a big argument about how flight was achieved. And if you think about how birds evolved... There's still a bit of discussion about how and when birds evolved because it seems like there were sort of two big, I guess, evolutionary events that produced very bird-like animals. Um, one was much earlier in, in the Jurassic uh, where you had things like Archaeopteryx, um, which were sort of four-winged, gliding type um, dinosaurs or birds, theropods, um, but they didn't have the, the capability of powered flight. So that's one of the things that separates things like raptors and even Archaeopteryx from modern birds is modern birds, let me see if I can point it out without getting bit here. Um, modern birds have right around here on their front rib area, they have a keel, which is sort of a, about muscle attachment, and that allows their wings to um, be able to actively flap. So that is how modern birds achieve powered flight. And the other thing is they've got actually special wrist bones that allow them to do sort of a clockwise sort of, or not clockwise, a figure eight type motion. Um, and actually some raptors even have that. Um, so that is another thing that links birds and theropods together. Um, you know, and of course we call these derived theropods because the, the further down the line you get, they get more advanced and, you know, you go from, um, you know, an animal that had feathers and a wrist bone that allowed wrist movement to an animal that might be able to glide. Uh, and then you you have an animal that, that might be able to actually achieve powered flight. So uh, as I was saying, the first sort of, I guess, act of the symphony of nature that produced birds, um, you had these sort of gliding 
um, animals, but they weren't necessarily powered flyers. Um, and we've got a lot of evidence from um, places like Germany um, where, uh, um, oh gosh, I just forgot the name of it, um, where they actually have really nicely preserved skeletons of, um, of Archaeopteryx uh, type animals. And then much later on, later in the Cretaceous, uh, and we're finding a lot of evidence in China, there was sort of the second act uh, of, you know, sort of the symphony of evolution, as I like to think of it, where you start to see modern-like birds in the fossil record uh, that resemble much more um, the birds that we see today with some primitive features like teeth. So it's really interesting to get a bird that looks like it could be a modern, even a modern songbird, but they've got these little teeth on them. You'll notice that no moss here. Hi. <laughs> no moss does not have teeth. She's got a, <laughs> she's got, <laughs> she, I, uh, okay. So much for being a serious scientist now. Uh, that's all out the window. <laughs> You can see, oh, gross. She can see she's a, she's an affectionate bird here. And, um, but she doesn't have a beak or she doesn't have teeth. She has a beak, which is made of keratin, which is the same stuff that your fingernails are made of. And her, her beak is, is shaped, like I said, for, for cracking seeds and nuts. And what's really cool about her too, she's got this tongue that almost acts as a, like a second appendage, like a, a finger or something. Uh, and you can see she's grooming me now and uh, she likes my glasses. But you'll notice in our um, in our raptor skull here, poof, there are definitely teeth there. So uh, we say that uh, teeth are sort of more of a primitive um, feature of the, I guess, the theropod dinosaurs. So we do actually have some birds in Kansas that they actually, uh, there is a ichthyornis uh, that was a, a diving bird and then a hesperornis, or is it the other way around? I think ichthyornis was the flying bird and hesperornis was the diving bird. Um, but they both possess teeth and they're both from Kansas during the late early late Cretaceous, as we call it. So there are birds out there with feathers that actually have a very modern bird body plan and they possess some primitive features that again, we can connect to dinosaurs. So if there are any questions that people have that are might be watching during this live stream, go ahead and try to post those questions. I'm doing my best to catch them. Um, but like I said, it's just me right now and a bird. So it's a little hard. And then I've got Seamus over here, but you can tell he's doing what Seamus does, which is not much. So I, I don't have a whole lot of backup here for, for fielding questions, but I'm hoping to getting it, you know, hoping that we'll have a discussion going here uh, and then I can answer some questions instead of just sit here and talk to myself. So if anybody has questions, now is the time. Um, so... Uh, that's sort of what I've got today. Um, unless you guys have questions, um, either about Nomas, the bird, or our dinosaurs that are related to birds. Um, and this is a pretty, here, let me, it's a pretty beat up skull cast. I carry this around with me whenever I go, uh, to do, um, outreach programs sort of all around Western Kansas. So this, this skull has, it's a cast. I never bring actual skulls out of the museum because if they get broken, well, you can imagine that that would be a pretty devastating thing. So I always bring skull casts out and this, this skull cast has seen a lot of, of miles. So this is, Again, this is um, a Deinonychus or Deinonychus, depending on 
how you like to pronounce it. And this is a what I would consider a medium-sized uh, North American raptor from the western part of North America. Um, we know that these animals were fond of um, small plant-eating animals called tenontosaurs. We have a lot of evidence uh, that they would uh, hunt in packs and would take down these these tenontosaurs. And uh, we've got tooth marks on bones and we've got a lot of shed teeth on kill sites that sort of support the idea that they were pack hunters. So these guys would have stood about four feet tall and been about six feet long from nose to tail. So like I said, medium size raptor from North America. Uh, Michelle is asking if I have a favorite dinosaur related to birds. And if so, are any of them in Kansas? Well, um, that's a tough question. Um, my favorite dinosaur of all time is actually Allosaurus, and it is a theropod dinosaur, so it's safe to say that um, it is probably, I guess, related to birds distantly. It's in that same family, but it's not very closely related. Um, and no, we don't unfortunately have a lot of Allosaurus in Kansas for two reasons. Number one, Allosaurs are a Jurassic dinosaur, and we don't have a lot of Jurassic sediments in Kansas. And of course, number two, uh, during the time of dinosaurs, um, Kansas was underwater for a good portion of the of the Cretaceous period. Um, so while in the very, very late Cretaceous, let's say the last, you know, the last few million years of the Cretaceous, there may very well have been dinosaurs running around this area as the seaway would have receded, but the conditions for preservation were just not there. So not a lot of dinosaur material in Kansas. It does happen once in a while, but not very often. Uh, Teresa, I have read that there are some scientists who don't believe that birds descended from dinosaurs, but from some yet as of... <laughs> as undiscovered animal outside the dinosaur lineage, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Are they kind of in denial or is there any evidence that all birds are not descended from dinosaurs? And what are they basing their claims on? Well, uh, Teresa, you're, you're correct. There were, well, the last time I checked, there were only two um, professional paleontologists that I knew of that argued against a dinosaur bird relationship. Um, and since then, one of them has passed away. Uh, and the, there's, there's only one guy left. And for at least the 10 years that, or the 11 years that I was in school studying paleontology, um, they kept recycling the same argument over and over and over and didn't put out a whole lot of new evidence to um, support their claims. It was just a rehash of the same idea that has never been very well supported by the fossil record. So um, I'm going to say at this point, the majority of, of paleontology kind of agrees that Birds are dinosaurs when we call them avian theropods. So hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Um, Ashley is asking, what is my bird's name and what kind of bird is he or she? Um, she her name is Nomas. That was the name that she had when we adopted her. Um, my guess is somebody who previously owned her spoke Spanish and sometimes she's a little noisy because she's, you know, she's just like my dog. If you can hear my dog on the other side of the door, uh, she wants to be part of the family and sometimes she feels neglected and will make a bunch of noise and it's very easy to go no moss. So that just sort of became her name. She is a Quaker parrot and, um, she is a female. We know she's a female because we've actually had her lay eggs about three times in the 15 or so years that we've had her. So um, very, uh, very cool bird. Any other questions? Um, 
So um, there are a lot of questions about dinosaurs. Uh, if people out there want to tell me what their favorite dinosaurs are and, you know, wonder if they're related to birds, that's a cool thing. You could do that. Um, or if you want to ask me any other questions about any of the other subjects that we've talked about in the last three weeks, uh, I would be glad to uh, address any of those as well. Um, this is a little odd. I'm, I'm used to having a whole museum to run around in, and it's, it's a little bit harder for me to have... <laughs> Um, one of these live feeds if I can't bounce from subject to subject and show you all the things I'm thinking of. So this has been a little bit challenging for me. And uh, um, where are you going? Where are you going? Okay. Um, uh, it's, yeah, I'm confined. It's no fun. Um, so I hope everybody else is doing well. Um, if there are no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. This is going to be a short live feed today. Um, and I will be back tomorrow with something interesting. I'm not sure what yet. Um, the weather has turned on me, so I won't be doing any outdoor geology stuff. Um, yes, Teresa, it's really hard to pick a favorite dinosaur. There's so many, uh, their dinosaurs are really cool. Um, they, they're, they're, uh, um, bizarre looking animals. Their dinosaurs have these long claw like fingers almost, um, and I don't know very much about them, although I did see a clutch of what was thought to be Therizinosaur eggs when I was doing some research at the Royal Ontario Museum about 11, 12 years ago. So that was kind of neat to see. Uh, but I, I don't know that much about Therizinosaurs. They're a bizarre little animal or big animal as the case may be. Um, so yeah, that's a cool dinosaur. Um, You really like velociraptors? Did you know that A, velociraptors are not from North America? They're in fact from China. They're found often in the Mongolian desert and they're not very big. They're they're about the size of a, a goose or a turkey, um, maybe a little bit bigger. But um, I was really disappointed when I saw my first velociraptor skull. Um, I, I was you know thinking it was gonna be all Jurassic Park and it wasn't. Um, although if you've ever been chased by a goose or a chicken or a, a swan, that's big enough. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm terrified. My mom raised geese when I was a kid. And from the time I was in about fifth grade until I was in high school, they would literally wait for me to leave for school and come home for school just to intimidate me. Um, you know, even, even when I was old enough to drive a car, they would literally chase my car up the driveway and then when I would come home, they would stand in front of my car or at the car door for like five or 10 minutes and wait for me to, I would have to wait for them to go away, to get bored and go away before I could get out of the car without getting attacked. Well, only one of them was really mean. Uh, sorry, I, I got to reading comments here. So Dino, Dino Cheris, is that how you pronounce that? I'm actually not familiar with, with that, that dinosaur. You spent your childhood looking at pictures, just some of those huge arms wondering what kind of creature they belong to. Very cool. It seems like you've actually, uh, Teresa, you kind of have done a lot of research on your own. Uh, so I think that's really cool that you're into it. Geese are terrifying. <laughs> they are. Uh, it, Luckily, it didn't ruin my uh, interest in birds. Uh, not all birds are mean, are they? So, um, but yes, you can actually see the dinosaur in geese or swans uh, or even chickens. Um, when they, especially when they're protecting, during the spring especially, when they're protecting their, their young, you know, and they put their neck down in that sort of aggressive posture, you don't have to use a whole lot of imagination to see the non-avian dinosaur um, heritage there that, that exists in them. Um, so, yeah, they're <laughs> – and they don't have teeth. Imagine things that have teeth. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I think um, that will do it for my live feed today. Uh, again, I will check in with you at 2 p.m. Central tomorrow. Uh, as always um, – 
Continue to send comments and questions even when this isn't live streaming. Uh, please like and share um, these these live feeds. Um, Rachel likes Parasaurolophus. Are they related to birds? No. Actually, um, parasaurs and, and duckbills are from a, a different line of dinosaurs that are not as closely related to birds. So even though they're called duckbills, they actually don't have a very close relationships relationship to the modern birds that we see today. I'm not a, Teresa says she's not a professional, but a lifelong paleontology nerd and an amateur paleo artist. Maybe I'll get paid for it someday. I've been drawing prehistoric critters since I was probably three or so. Well, keep on doing that. I think there's a lot of application for paleo art uh, in the world. And um, uh, I have been dabbling in paleo art myself uh, in the form of fabrication and um, sort of trying to reconstruct some lifelike animals. Uh, so maybe that'll be a subject for one of a future live feed when I can get back to the museum and get to my stuff. So, um, yeah, keep going. Uh, Teresa, that's awesome. Um, Ashley says that Triceratops is her favorite. Um, I like Triceratops too. Um, I worked with a guy called John Scanella, who is sort of a Triceratops guru and I learned a lot from him. Um, but, uh, that's a story for another time. Um, shout out to John Scanella. He is the curator now at the Stern, uh, at the Sternberg, at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. Um, but he, uh, was very influential when I was a student. We had a lot of fun together. So, uh, definitely look up, uh, Scanella's work and, as, and, and Andy Farkey's work as well. They're, they're, they offer two, uh, very interesting sides of a discussion of, what Triceratops uh, adults may or may not be. So uh, we, won't, we won't open that kind of worms for this discussion, maybe some other time. Um, so anyways, I am about to sign off. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching, everybody. Um, it, it really gives all of us something on the museum staff to do, to look forward to. Um, I'm hoping eventually I'll make it back to the museum and, and won't be stuck in my basement as much. Um, but until then, I'm going to do what uh, the best thing uh, for the time is. <laughs> and I hope everybody else is. I hope everybody is healthy and happy and safe uh, during this weird, weird time that we're living through. Um, and I will see you tomorrow. As always, like and share our stuff. Okay, uh, I'm going to head out. Say goodbye, Nomas. Say bye-bye. You going to say bye? No, she's not going to say anything because I'm asking her to. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, same time, same place.